Hello and welcome back to Demo Con Channel. here for RTD Season 4, Episode 3. The things that differentiate different tabletop gaming games. Evolution and differentiation are cornerstones of the tabletop gaming market. If a new game came out that is exactly the same as the last one, no one will play, no one will pay the crazy high hobby fees to get in. In this episode of the RTD, we will look at various game systems and what sets them apart from all other game systems in an attempt to see what elements people respond to. With me today are my panel, starting with Tony from the Sustainable Center. Hey, yo. <laughs> John from Wargame Pain, who's filling in for our co-host, Solid Smurf. I'm not as exciting, but I am in a suit, so I yeah. think it's a good trade-off. <laughs> Excellent. And Grim's 40 Blazer. What's up, guys? All right, we are going straight to question number one. GW's Warhammer Fantasy and 40K are often cited as the 800-pound gorilla of the tabletop market. What things did they do to differentiate or establish themselves as a commercially successful product? And uh, to start this, we're going to go on over to John from Wargame Painting. All right, uh, well, I think that the thing that they did the – most different from everything else is that they've got the 25 years of backstory compared to all the other companies, and they have this really strong foundation that they've been building on top of, where these new guys don't really have it as much. They've been around for three, four, five years. So it's hard to compete with that much just already ahead of the game. So I'm not sure that they've done anything different, really. It's more that they've just been there the longest. It's like, no. All right. Uh, we're going to now move on to Tony. Give us your answer, man. Uh, I would say when they initially started, um, they were competing against uh, historical miniatures games, and what they did is they took a sci-fi spin on that. So they took it from people who were hard hardcore historicals, considering themselves about uh, historical accuracy and reenacting specific battles, which is a, a limited space, and they made it a limitless space. Uh, the one great thing about Games Workshop's products is they offer a wide diversity of opportunities to create any fluff and background and story and army within that specific force set. Uh, unlike, you know, in War Machine, you know, Signar's blue, and it's really hard to justify painting them purple or pink. Whereas if you play Dark Eldar, you can you can make them whatever you want. You can make them any any cabalite that you want. So I think that creating that open platform. Uh, and also differentiating themselves initially from uh, the historicals was the big things that initially uh, set them apart from competitors. Being the first also helps. <laughs> and uh, Grim's Ford Blazer. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to expound a little bit on Tony. Um, just the ease of the customization of the products and the push to personalize it for each individual to make it their own, um, I think is a big differentiator. Instead of trying to copy whatever historical format was for historical wargaming or if it's like a fantasy game trying to get the exact colors that you see in, in their rule book for a different game, you can personalize it and GW pushes that and it plot and it appeals to a lot of people. And having a vertically integrated company I think helps a lot because they have all the retail support, they have the customers more, they control the product line as well. Uh, I kind of agree with everything that uh, both Tony and Grimm said. The, if, if you look historically, you go to the historicals, and then you start having this D&D campaign idea notion of chain mail early on with Gary Gygax, and all of a sudden, boom, you have Warhammer. And um, where they really kind of excelled was the notion of expanding on really, really large fantasy, either science fiction or – traditional fantasy type uh, genre and the customization. Um, any further discussion? <laughs> All right. I here we go. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. All right. Being as I'm the youngest on the panel, I guess I don't really have the background to pick up on it. I mean, I've, I've never seen anybody in my generation even pick up a historical game. I mean, there's Flames of War, but Really, again, my generation doesn't really pick it up, so my background perspective is a little bit off compared to you guys. Not calling you guys old, but that's okay. so so for so, we so all for use me, walkers when we come to the table. It's all good. <laughs> so for me, uh, the the thing is, it, it was just that they were the first on the market. I mean, and listening to your arguments, I have to, I have to agree with all three of you and say that it was. The, the, just the defining factor of here's something new. 
All right. And, I, I think uh, the what, capture rate is. is I was sorry, just going to add something a little. No, 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 Tony, jump in. I, I think the. Okay, I think the capture rate is phenomenal. I don't think any of us could have said that we play the other games we play because we started with them. We always started with. 40k or fantasy most of us 40k and then found privateer press and then found infinity and then found so it's the it's the entry portal it's the vault and um i think without games workshop it would actually hurt other companies because they've done a lot of the, the legwork for 25 years and they're the, the the barrier to entry they're what get people in the game and they're the most heavily advertised in a very limited marketing space you don't see ads or commercials for them really anywhere but uh they're, they're, they're the entry point to all the war gaming that we, uh, that we find in experience. I would agree. I would agree that from a science fiction and fantasy perspective, that is truly probably the case. Uh, but I do think we do have some converts from historical and modern gaming as well as RPGs. Grims, you got anything else to throw in there? No. All right. Words. <laughs> Question number two. What <laughs> things differentiate and draw people to the privateer press stable of games such as War Machine and Hordes? And for this, we're actually going to start with Tony from the Sustainable Center. Uh, I think what draws them to it is the, the rage that they experience by playing a, a Games Workshop product, either upset with the rules or their inability to uh, – to, to play models that they want and be competitive and not get blasted off the table or to not find out when their new army book gets released that half the stuff they own is completely crap. Uh, if you play Tyranids, you would, you would know what that feeling is like. Um, so I, I think that's the, uh, the, the main element that, that, that makes people want to go to these other games. Uh, some people do stick with, you know, 40K and fantasy, but I, I think that's the main barrier entry is, is frustration and wanting a change. All right. Grims, what's your thoughts being the Tyranid player in the group? Yeah, I was just, my heart just dropped. Um, but I think I think a lot of it has to do with actually the genre. I think people are like predisposed to a certain type of likes. Like some people like anime type things. Some people like fantasy. Some people like. And I think Privateer Press is really stuck in that little steampunk fantasy type of world. That I think that's big in other types of moods like comic books or. Um, cartoons or whatever is out there and i think that draws a lot of people but i also think a lot of it's the centralization that they try to do with the rule books and how they individualize um everything where you can have one big rule book and then you have the cards for the models and you're good to go almost right for every game very very true john what's your thoughts well i actually had this conversation today at a generic con with a group of people who are looking over my game system and we were talking about it, it was it's really based on time simplicity of picking it up and the fact that we don't have to deal with as many models like with privateer press you can get an army of like three four figures on the table and still feel satisfied that you're doing stuff with them if you tried to run a 40k game with three or four guys you'd be like this is there's no point to playing this i can play checkers but with war machine and hordes it's each model does something so cool or they have so much life or you know whatever with the jacks that you still feel like that accomplishment for having an epic game with so few guys that you don't have to invest a ton of money, you don't have to invest a ton of time. And that's what we came up with today, and I, I agree with that. Uh, for me, what I see people saying about privateer press games is that there's a consistent notion of balance between armies, not only between versions of the game, but updates to the game between the separate armies. Um, it... it it lowers the the knowledge you need to have in order to build up a, a realistic army. It doesn't have to be A, B, and C. Uh, and this is accomplished because you're using two dice instead of one, which allows a bell-shaped curve to the thing. So there's, there's a better expectation of knowing ahead of time what your individual models can actually do once you've played it a few times. The other thing that I think differentiates them a great deal is the notion that um, they have, again, with that balanced, consistent rule that isn't limited – it doesn't limit people's ability to just go crazy with the customization of the models. While it doesn't seem to be as 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 big a thing as as what would occur in a 40k army, the outcome of any kind of uh, customization, whether or not you pick a huge banner on a model or whatever, um, the rules actually uh, handle that based solely on base size. So the questions in the game aren't there the game is a little bit more friendly and because of that because there's no real questions on the rules uh further discussion 
I think that that that's an issue actually with uh, with privateer press because again they because they control they, they create a finite bubble so your casters are all named they can only do certain things where in Games Workshop's products yeah the name characters have become more prevalent in the past few years and a lot of people take them but on the same token you can take just generic people and give them more gear and therefore it makes the game infinitely more complex and more difficult co to control the outcome and make it a balanced and fair game so I think. GW trades for an open platform balance for where Privateer Press has a more defined platform and they, they achieve more balance. But having that open platform and that creativity, I think, is something that sells to people because if I'm going to spend this much money, I want to feel the ability that I can create my own world, create my own army and paint it and play it the way I want other than playing this named character or these few named characters and these few named Jacks constantly. I understand, but I'm actually not talking from the game perspective. I'm talking from the hobby perspective. The way that the rules are actually defined in the Privateer Press products means that you are – not limited at all. You do not either create an unfair advantage or disadvantage no matter how much you want to personalize your model, stick your Warcaster on top of a, a post that's eight feet tall if you want. It doesn't change the rules governing that particular model because he's on a base that's this size. Any other further discussion? Well, I feel like 40K can get that in there too. I mean, I I don't like to think that I'm a fanboy. I still think it's a fun game, but, I mean, if you, well, for example, I mean, I've got this right here. I finally got the desire to build this one again, but it's it's super high up there. I mean, that's just detrimental to me. I mean, so usually Games Workshop punishes that thing, but if you want to do it to make it look cool, I mean, it's a disadvantage more than anything else. So I feel like the eight feet tall thing, you could get away with it in 40K, but it's going to be detrimental to you, whereas in Primature Press it's not. Well, so, I don't um, that's like actually the, what I'm saying, the that, argument. that the, the hobbyists aren't bound by the rules. Um, Greg, any other thoughts there? Well, I think that goes down to, like, the core issue. I feel like Privateer Pass Press has, like, looked at their games rules and the game system a lot more than how their models interact with the game. I think they've, they've taken the core system of the rules, and then they found models that apply to it. You know, they've tried to make great models to go with the game. Um, Games Workshop, I feel, is almost hobby first, and then the rules are a bit more of an afterthought. And I think that goes to why people play a lot more, or at least, or at least trying out these other systems, because they want to play a fun game, and now I feel like the barriers to making great models is coming down a lot. Excellent last thought. I agree. Thought. I mean, oh. I'm sorry, John. Well, well, you guy, speak up, man. The guy. <laughs> I was speaking of, no, but the, uh, the guys that I was talking to at Gen Con, they were really smart, and they said that if you're developing a game, start with a blank base, and if you can make a game that can be run with a bunch of guys playing with checker pieces, that's going to be an awesome game, and I think that's what Privateer Press did. I think that they decided, what can we do with blank bases, and then they went in and said, okay, now let's put something on top of the bases, and I, I think Grim said it exactly right. GW is like, let's make the most awesome-looking guy that we can, except for, the, like, the new stuff, because I'm not a big fan of the wolves, but the, the, the Trigon. Let's make a Trigon. It's awesome, it's big, it's scary, and now let's write rules for it. And I think they do that with the fluff, too, but that's, a, that's another issue. All right. Moving on to question number three. What things define and differentiate a game like Flames of War? That's question number three. For this, we're going to start with – who haven't we started with? Grims? Go ahead. <laughs> right. So I think, that, I think the big thing about Flames of War is it itches the, those people out there that love historical war games. And they're – obviously, I don't think they're you know necessarily like – my age and younger. I'm 28. I'll put that out there. But, you know, I think it hits those, those, those people that definitely love historical wargaming. And it's got a simplified rule set. If, if anybody had played like the older historical wargaming, my goodness, the rules were off the charts. I don't even think a D&D rule book was large enough to fit all of it. But it, it definitely was they had they had rules for everything and everything down to the last guy. And I think that that makes a, a big difference for people that really want to play Flames of War. They want a simple game, but it itches that historical genre. John, what's your thoughts? 
Well, I've never actually played Flames of War. Uh, I've seen it played, though, and I've heard people talk about it. So um, I feel like it, it really is that kind of, it's the new age um, military-based, like, historical games that people can get behind if, they, if they're into that. I mean, um, it's not really particularly big around me. I, I think I've seen one person ever buy something for it and never even, like, really played it. And I don't know if any of my game stores actually have Flames of War Night. So I really don't have a very big pool to pull off of for this question, but um, from what I've seen, the models are uh, are unique. They're a much smaller size, so that's something that they've got going for them, too. Um, they've got the uniqueness factor in there. And again, uh, just the historical factor is something unique compared to all the sci-fi fantasy stuff that we see elsewhere. Tony, what's your thoughts? I, uh, I agree with all of this, and there's really not too much that I can add to it. I think that they created the bridge between the historical war gamers and us, the fantasy fictional war gamers. And the game is very historical. Uh, however, yet it, it brings a simplicity of, of game structure and game mechanics. But there's still a big differentiation. You're playing with units on a single base, a very tiny single base. The scale is greatly reduced. So it's complete change where somebody looking at playing, am I going to play Infinity or Privateer Press or GW? There's pivots, but it's still generally a 28 millimeter sci-fi-ish model. Um, playing with a sci-fi set, rule set, where Flames of War is out in its totally different space. And I, I think all the games have been somewhat inspired by the World War II massiveness um, because th that's where all the major war battles took from. So I, I think that that's what makes Flames of War popular, but it's very hit and miss, as like John said. Uh, I, I agree with everything that everyone said. The fact that it's at a 15 millimeter scale, and actually some of the battles that I've seen make a 40K game model count-wise look look like a skirmish game and i'm talking on the apocalypse scale uh you a simplified rule set which really effectively means there's only like nine or so different types of units based on their level of experience and their level of how long they've been there and all that kind of stuff uh really does kind of permit a lot of people to get into the game relatively quickly and Quite honestly, it's kind of an extension, you know, of, as Gerns was saying, it, it tends to favor an, an older gamer mindset, but I think a lot of it has to do with that. Um, a lot of the people who play Flames of War when they were kids were playing with army men, uh, which has kind of lost um, some, some of its um, excitement level with kids as uh, video games and the, and the like have kind of become more predominant. Um, any further discussion? I think one of the great things that Flames of War did was they 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 try they still made it tactical in their in their game system like removing essentially there's no turn limit people just set their own time limit so you could come back to the board and still play out that historical event that you wanted to and I think the modifiers on the game like for terrain because there's, everything's so small on a scale it makes it pretty simple to start calculating and I think dice are less of a a gamble. You really know pretty much what you're going to do, so there's a lot more tactics that come out of it because they've defined what everything can move, how far. It's not, you know, based on what you roll on a on a die from a d6 to a d20 or whatever it is. I've kind of seen that um, even though it's a, like I said a very uh, a relatively simplified rule set that people have been able to really come close to depicting actual scenarios uh, just within the confines of the rule system that it has, which I think is um, amazing for a, for a rule system to be able to pull off. Tony, do you have anything else to throw in there? I think also because they're up front and they say the game is not totally balanced. And what I mean by that, depending upon the, I forget what they're called, but whatever time period you pick up, if it's late 44, early 45, and you want to play Nazi Germany, you, they tell you up front, you have a very uphill battle. They don't have a lot of resources. They don't have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Whereas if flip it against 1941, you're playing Russia against Germany, you're not going to have a lot of resources. You're not going to have a lot of options. And you play this army knowing that it's going to be very difficult and highly unlikely that you're going to win. It's more about understanding that there is not balance when you're recreating historical time frames and you're trying to do what-if scenarios. Um, and I think that that's something that, that they're upfront and honest about and combined that's also based on historicals allows them to get away with that where sci-fi, it's just the rules people screwing us over. It's like people like to think and they're just making it up um, where they're basing it off historical facts. They never said in Flames of War that Stalingrad was won by Germany. It, it, they didn't go that route. They made sure it was true. Um, and I think that's what allows them to do what they do. Nice. Well, this is the conclusion of part one. We'll be back with part two very, very soon.
new game came out that is its ex- ah, I'm going to need to restart. Hold on. What things differentiate and draw people to the privateer press stable of... Ah, I'm going to have a lot of editing. 